What happens in a superconductor is that B0 falls to a value zero well within the body of the superconductor. Lambda is seen to be the characteristic length associated with this decay. Lambda is in fact the distance within the superconductor at which the field falls to B0 over E of its surface value. In the body of the superconductor both the electric field and the magnetic field are equal to zero. We've seen that the magnetic field decays to zero from the surface over a characteristic length lambda and similarly currents only operate in the surface of the superconductor and decay over the same characteristic length. But if the dimensions of the superconductor become small and particularly small compared to the penetration depth then of course much less of the field is excluded and therefore the superconductivity can persist to higher fields and for instance for a thin film of superconductor of thickness D we can write field is equal to HC lambda over D and there is a factor of root 3 in there so we can have superconductivity persisting in very thin filaments, lamella superconductors. If the size of the sample is of comparable dimensions to uh, the penetration length, then new things happen, actually. Lambda increases, HT2 increases. And this really gives new possibilities, which have to be examined, which might be used for new concepts. I was reminded by the, of work which my supervisor, David Schonberg, had done before the war. Now, uh, David uh, had been interested in superconductivity in the, in the pre-war times, and he had thought of a very ingenious way of measuring how the magnetic field penetrates into a superconductor. Uh, mercury is a superconductor, and mercury, of course, uh, at room temperature, is a liquid, and if you mix mercury with chalk and grind it up together and go on grinding and grinding and grinding, you will eventually get a very, very fine mixture of uh, chalk powder uh, and tiny globules of mercury. In fact, uh, David uh, didn't invent this himself because any chemist in those days uh, knew how this was done because they used a mixture of mercury ground up in chalk to cure syphilis. Uh, so chemists knew all about it. Uh, and and uh, so he, he took this. Now, <clears throat> when, when, when you cool this uh, mixture of tiny globules of mercury, they freeze into mercury spheres. Uh, and those spheres are so small that the magnetic field can penetrate almost all the way through. Uh, at, high, at just below the te temperature at which the, the mercury becomes superconducting, uh, the magnetic field penetrates right, right the way through and the mercury doesn't appear to be magnetic at all. But as you cool the mercury below the transition temperature of superconductivity, as you cool it, then the field penetrates less and less to a small distance and the little spheres of mercury become diamagnetic. And he could measure the magnetic moment as a function of temperature and get a very nice measurement of how the penetration was, de was changing with temperature. Uh, and when I found my new way of doing it with, with microwaves, uh, I found that we agreed on, on... We were measuring slightly different things, but they were quite consistent with one another. And so we, we, we then had a formula for the way in which the penetration depth varied with temperature. And that formula remained a valid formula for many, many years afterwards. Uh, it's been changed slightly since then, but, but the general idea was good. Uh, I, 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 I needn't go into detail of how 
that formula was devised. It was devised on the basis of totally erroneous physics, uh, but it was a formula which worked. And that's, that, that's, from a practical point of view, that was the right thing. Penetration depth, which is usually written lambda, uh, varies as a constant over 1 minus the temperature over the critical temperature for superconductivity, all that to the fourth power, and the square root of all that. That's a curve which looks like that.